Maybe I can make it tighter. Because the problem is this. See, it becomes... Just clip it? Okay. I think I take that one. Yeah. If that's okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashfil mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad. Uh, my name is Harun. Uh, Harun Mughal. That's me right there. Uh, you are all here for part two of a discussion about the history of Muslim Spain. Except for those of you who are here in January, we do this one backwards. Uh, so we talked about how Muslim Spain declined and disappeared. Now we're going to talk about how it rose. And there's a reason for that order of things. Uh, but before we start, formally, I have a few ground rules. Uh, the first is, who am I? Uh, I'm someone who has studied uh, all of my life, pretty much, since a very young age. Islamic history, Islamic thought, Islamic philosophy. It's a passion of mine. That does not mean I know everything. It just means I know enough that it is something I am able to do on a regular basis. It's a blessing. It's something fun. But it's not meaningful to me unless it's also meaningful to you. And so the second rule is that ask questions, right? You can ask me questions. If we don't get through everything, I don't know how the ICM people will feel about this, but we'll just do a part three. Uh, but you can ask any questions you want, no matter how strange or weird or unfamiliar it might feel, uh, you can ask me anything. And if I can answer it, I will answer it. If I can't, I will go back and try to find an answer and get back to you. So if I say anything that is unfamiliar, that is strange, that is confusing, by all means challenge me and I will especially ask uh, for the women, the sisters, to also uh, make sure they feel comfortable asking questions because a lot of times in Muslim spaces uh, we don't include women in our conversations uh, and we don't allow them the opportunity to have the same engagement that the men do uh, and that's something that I think we have to consciously uh, work to uh, over overcome. So I'm going to start very quickly. Uh, also, I hope you like my slides. I work very hard on them. Um, they're very important. Everyone has a story, so if I say something boring, you can just ask me what the story is. Make sense? Everyone with me? We all understand the policy? Yes? What do you do if you don't understand something? Yusuf Bengali, what do we do? Yes. Are you a Pacers fan? Why do you, every time I see you, you have something Pacers on? Is weird. Like, what about the Pacers draws you towards them? Paul George, but he's not on the Pacers, is he? Yeah, that's what, exactly, man. You got like Zahid Jr. calling you out in the back, man. Yeah, anyway, okay, so this is actually great. Yusuf lives in the past just like this right here. So this is about the past. Yusuf also lives in the past. It's all good, right? Okay, so very quickly, this is what we're going to talk about. Why are we here studying Islamic history? History often seems, am I supposed to stand like directly in the ring light? Everyone on YouTube can see me? Okay, so why we're here? Three things. The first is, throughout the Islamic tradition, throughout the Quran, throughout the Sunnah, uh, Allah repeatedly, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly invokes history as a way where we can learn from the past in order to learn what kind of people to be. The second thing that's really important is that if some of us learn history, all of us can benefit. Just as, you know, if some of us learn uh, some things, all of us can benefit from those things. Every one of us is good at certain things and, frankly, bad at certain things, right? That's why we should have the ability to pursue the passions we want because then we all benefit from everyone's like particular specialization, right? And then the third and final thing I want you to think about is this is not a class about what happened a thousand years ago just because it happened a thousand years ago, is that what makes people really impressive when you look back on it, maybe Paul George even, I don't know, but what makes people impressive is when they creatively and thoughtfully face challenges. Does that make sense? Right? Life is not very interesting if life is easy. Life is interesting and life is meaningful when life is hard and people nevertheless take hard circumstances and do something impressive with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're good? Okay. So very quickly, um, in this class, we're going to talk about what are these? What are, what, are, what are forms of dinosaurs that are alive today? Wait, who said Tyrannosaurus Rex? You, sir, are living in a world where Tyrannosaurus Rex is still alive. This is, has no one watched Jurassic Park? Triceratops? No, right now. Who said birds? There's Reza right there. Rhinos? 
That's an interesting theory. Okay, dinosaurs. We're going to talk about that. The second thing, Reza especially, please forgive me. Everyone, do some istighfar. You're going to see something really painful. If you're sensitive, I want you to close your eyes. This might hurt. You're going to learn about this. What's this? A Viking. Who are the Vikings? You were a Viking. You were not. Look in the mirror, dude. Um, your friend was a real Viking. Okay, but you also believe T-Rex is still around, so I'm a little bit hesitant on this one. Yes, the, well, other than the people who are already here. Yes, Salam alaikum, Zahid, how are you? It's good to see you. Okay, who are the Vikings? Somebody, anybody. Yes, you, you haven't talked. People from Scandinavia, very good. Where is Scandinavia? Hello. Ah, this is all him, man. This is all him. Near Norway. Anyone else, where is Scandinavia? Poland, no. Close. That's Denmark. Yes, Denmark. One other country. The three countries... Greenland, mm, colony. Sweden, yes. Okay, Vikings. Everyone got me? We all know who the Vikings are? Right? This is important because this is going to come up. So I need to know that you know what I'm talking about. The Vikings are people from Scandinavia, right? Who spread out all over the world. And in a really weird way, and we're going to talk about this, they intersect with the history of Muslim Spain. Remember last time we talked about pirates? For those who were here, we talked about how Jack Sparrow's character was based on a Muslim, right? The guy that Johnny Depp played in Pirates of the Caribbean that Barbosa was Barbarossa was also based on a Muslim. Now we're going to go back even further in history and talk about the intersection of Vikings, not just with Muslim Spain, but with Muslims today, including some of the most live conflicts that are going on in the world right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're all with me? Okay, good. Now, what is this? A Lincoln Corsair. Yeah, that's not that important. Okay. Here's what I want to talk about. This is where we're going to start. In 1492, 700 years of Muslim rule over Spain came to an end. It hadn't come to an end abruptly. Muslim Spain was slowly declining. But in 1492, the last independently ruled Muslim kingdom in Spain collapsed. And the Muslims who remained in Spain were promised that they would be allowed to remain Muslim as long as they gave up certain privileges and rights and authority. They were defeated people. In fact, a few months after Muslim Spain's last independent kingdom surrendered, Columbus set off on his voyage. Those two things are connected. The Spanish could not begin exploring the New World, like the Vikings did, until they had secured control over the Iberian Peninsula. But very quickly, the promise was revoked. And over a period of about 120 years, Muslim communities in Spain were forcibly converted to Christianity, and even that was not enough. And eventually, the descendants of the people who had been forcibly converted right, were expelled from Spain en masse, most to North Africa, some to Eastern Europe, and some, as far as we know, made it as far as Siberia because there were Muslim-ruled kingdoms there. That is, in a sense, one of the first instances of Islamophobia turning violent and even genocidal. So here, if anyone, does anyone know what this is? You might, you, it's a, it might be a little bit older for some people, but those of us who have my hair loss and older um, should know what this is. Yes, India, where? Babri Masjid, yes. This was a masjid that was demolished in one of the first kind of out, outbursts of anti-Muslim sentiment. What is the second picture? The Gaba? Oh, you can't see it. That's okay. That's fair. You, you had a, if someone said a graveyard. Yes, you said Bosnia, right? This is Srebrenica, where actually we're very close to the anniversary. On July 11th, 1995, uh, almost 8,000 Muslim boys and men between the ages of 12 and 74 were killed over a period of three days. It was the single most violent episode in a four-year ethnic cleansing of Muslim populations from the country of Bosnia. And the last one over there, does anyone know what that map is referring to? Or is a map of? Anyone? No. Good guess, though. No. That is the West Bank. That is the West Bank, including Jerusalem. So 
in a sense, you have a very slow, uh, guys over there, uh, I'm going to ask, excuse me, hey, Yusuf, we good? Thank you. Okay, so um, over there, you have um, the gradual conquest of Palestinian land, which is being expropriated into Israeli settlements, right? So you have the elimination of an indigenous population, first at the political level, and then slowly, culturally, and otherwise. Does that make sense? One of the first times this happened is in Andalus, in Muslim Spain. And we're going to talk today about why that happened, about how that happened, and what lessons we can take from that, which may not be the lessons that you would expect that we could or should take from that. And the lesson I want you to leave with, sorry, is twofold. And this is really important to understand when we study history. When power has no conscience, it is dangerous. When people pursue per power for the sake of power, right? And the most notable example I would say in the United States today is someone like Donald Trump. He wants to be in charge simply in order to be in charge. What he stands for changes every five to 10 minutes as long as the attention remains on him, right? So his policies are unstable. He never admits to making any mistakes. When he is confronted with having to uh, deal with anyone who disagrees with him, fundamentally he, he, he changes the conversation, right? There is no humility. Power without conscience is dangerous. But this is also important to understand, conscience without power is helpless. So it's very easy from far away to say, oh, if I was in power, I would never do that. Or I don't want to get it. I don't want to have any kind of power or authority because then I would have to make difficult choices. But the reality is we all have to make difficult choices. And so the, the theme that I want to focus on for today is this idea that we actually all do have power in different ways. We have physical strength. We have financial strength. We have professional strength. Everyone in different ways, from younger to older, has some kind of power. The question is, how do we use it? What do we use it for? What do we accomplish with it? And what do we prevent through it? Does all of that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So, we're going to start with Muslim Spain. And I'm going to go a little bit through some of these, because I don't think we need it as much. Actually, I'll start right here. So, Muslim Spain is often referred to as a conquest. How many of you have heard of the Moors? Right? Muslims conquer Spain and rule Spain for 400, 700 years. That's kind of true, but not really true. And if you know why that's not true, you will understand one of the greatest myths about our religion, who we are, where we came from, how we got to be Muslim, and to the point the Sheikh made actually earlier, I don't believe he's still here, but the point that he made about Dawah, about bringing people to Islam is actually incredibly relevant to this conversation, and I'm glad he said it. Because we often don't realize, because we let other people tell our history, where we came from. Now, how many of you heard the idea that Islam was spread by the sword? Yes, raise hands. Yeah, Muslims conquered and forcibly converted people, that's where we came from. It's actually not true. And it's actually in some ways more beautiful than that, in some ways more disappointing than that. So that's a picture of Joe Biden because he's eating ice cream. And I'm going to explain why this is important. People all over the world look at the same thing and understand it differently. Right? Some people think he's great. Not that many people, but some people do, right? Some people think he's terrible. It's the same person. You see what I'm saying? Spain this territory, in the minds of many Catholics and many modern-day Europeans, was a Christian country that was rudely interrupted by Muslims who arrived from North Africa, conquered it, ruled it, subjugated it, and then were kicked out. But, in fact, the people that we know as Moors were indigenously Iberian. There were invaders who came from North Africa. They did conquer Spain. They did not impose Islam, but instead they brought a Muslim culture into contact with Spain. And over centuries, Spain became 
a Muslim majority society in the exact same way that for example India Pakistan Bangladesh Egypt Turkey Bosnia Indonesia pretty much everywhere we know in the world that is majority Muslim today became Muslim over centuries so even after 300 years after Muslims arrived in Egypt Egypt was about 50% Muslim the same thing holds for Spain that over decades generations Spanish people became increasingly Muslim what does that mean it means that people didn't they weren't forced to become Muslim they chose to become Muslim the process happened very slowly and the ruling powers did not force people to become Muslim but they created a culture that was sufficiently attractive to people that they wanted to be a part of it any questions on that is that clear you following what I'm saying Yo, you have a, who has a question? Yes, sir. Most populated Muslim country, what do you think? Indonesia, you're right. Second? Oh, that's a matter of some debate. Sorry, are you Egyptian? I'm sorry, man. You're not there. You're not, don't get too angry. It's okay. You know, there's, there's, some people say India, some people say Pakistan. But here's a question. Who said Nigeria? Oh man, you always, you, he, this is what happens. He actually is, is listening to me. That's the dangerous thing, right? By the time, well, it's a long way in the future. But if you were one now, by the time you're 70, the most populated Muslim country in the world will actually probably be Nigeria, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but we'll talk about that later. What happens in the year 622? Gentlemen over there, you're on the spot. No, you already answered a question. Anyone? Come on. There's a lot of talking over here. I want to see some answers. I'm putting you, totally putting you on the spot. No, 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 yeah, no, not over there. Over here, somebody. What happens in the year 622? No, no, you're not over there, man. Why are you calling a Rayan, man? Rayan's like looking in the other direction. All right, how about the ladies? Does anyone know what happens in the year 622? You should know this. This is the most, this is one of the most important dates in the Muslim calendar. Hmm? Yes. What is your name? Yaqub. Brother Yaqub has the correct answer. Um, all the youth have failed. 622, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, migrates from where to where? Mecca to Medina. Yes, in 622. I want you to think about this. In the year 661. A very important Muslim is martyred. He becomes shaheed. He's assassinated. Abu Bakr was not martyred. Sorry? Anyone? Come on. Who said Hazrat Ali? Yes, Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu, the fourth and final of the righteous Khalifas, is assassinated. How is he killed? Is in what? No, how? Where? You're right. He's in Iraq. Yes. Yes. What is your name? Amir, you are my hero. Okay. He is killed. This is really, this is really messed up. He is killed in, I mean, it's, it's messed up, but it's also kind of beautiful if you think about what it means for his afterlife. He is the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Khalifa at the time, the commander of the believers, is killed. Do you know what prayer it was? Fajr prayer, when he's leading Salah in Sajda, when he is most defenseless. He is killed doing Sajda. Right? This is the, the father of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's grandsons, is killed leading prayers as Khalifa in the year 661. And power goes from the close companions of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. This is really important to understand. From them to a dynasty, the Umayyad dynasty. And they build an empire that is really large. And this creates a crisis in the Muslim world. Because on the one hand, they are the inheritors of the Khilafah. They have this huge empire. They've got palaces and power and massive armies. Everything's awesome. But is that what you stand for? 
Or is the question, what kind of ruler should you be? And what happens when the people who have the most upstanding character are shoved to the side in order to make way for the people who want the pomp and circumstance? And the Umayyads, who take power in 661, immediately after Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, is assassinated, continue expanding and into Spain and the south of France. That's how Islam comes to Spain. And I want you to look at the dates a little bit. 661, Hazrat Ali is assassinated. 711, Tariq ibn Ziyad, who is 20 years old, to put your life into perspective, um, brings a Muslim army from Jabal Tariq, Gibraltar, named after him, because he's kind of important, into the south of Spain. 711, meaning that about 100 years before this, how many Muslims are in the world? Not many is true. About how many? When is the first revelation? Oh. 610 is correct, yes. Who are the first Muslims? Name them, someone, anyone. Abu Bakr, yes. Hazrat Khadija, who else? <laughs> Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I mean, that's true, yeah, that's true. Ali, Ali yes, Hazrat Ali. Anyone else? Abu Bakr, I think we said that. Anyone? Nothing? Hazrat Usman. It, basically, you can count the number of Muslims on your hands. Does that make sense? So, you've got like 10 Muslims in the world. And a hundred years later, just imagine what this means like psychologically, culturally, emotionally, how weird this is. That Islam is being preached privately, in secret, because you're in fear for your life. And a hundred years later, you've got a guy who wasn't even alive, from a family that had nothing to do with Arabia, crossing the Mediterranean from Africa into Spain to a place he's never seen before. He's Amazigh, he's not even Arab, he's not an Arab, he's Amazigh, colloquially they're sometimes called Berbers. The term is sometimes taken derogatorily, but he's they're native to North Africa, right? They've become Muslim. His name is Tariq, right? Now there's a mountain named after him, Gibraltar Jabal Tariq, right? Now, the distance from Medina to this place where he lands, Medina Sidonia, near the Barbate River, that distance it's okay. is how many miles? 14 miles? Oh yeah, from Morocco, but from, from Medina to the south of Spain is the same distance as it is from Cincinnati to Juneau, Alaska. You're doing this a long time ago without any of the technology we rely on. They are in, in some ways, uncharted territory, which is kind of crazy. They're expanding along trade routes. It's not like they're just randomly like going places, right? They're, they know where things come from. They know where they get things from. They're pursuing trade. And they move into Spain. Tariq ibn Ziyad is a very famous story. He has, according to some estimates, 8,000 men. A few hundred are Arab. Most of them are Amasikh. There's ethnic tensions because they don't always get along. right? There's internal tensions. And they've crossed into Spain. And his soldiers are like, look, I mean, colloquially, like, look, man, we've been going for a really long time. We're really tired. We have no idea where we are. And we keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. When is this going to stop? And do you know what Tariq does? Who said that? Yes, Ami. Ami wins. Also because she's Ami. Um, he burns the boats, which is like a really weird leadership model, right? Like it, it either really going to work or really not going to work, right? Because they come across under cover of night from, as you said, 14 miles from, from what is now Morocco into Spain by boat, right? to a place they've never been before. There's a conflict within the Spanish elite between two different types of Christians, Catholics, who are Trinitarians, if you know this, and Arian Christians, A-R-I-A-N, who believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, is not the Son of God. He is a kind of sacred figure, but he's not divine. And they are fighting with each other, and the Arians appeal to the Muslims and say, hey, can you come help us? And Tariq ibn Ziyad says, this sounds like a great opportunity, and he brings an army there. The army is on the verge of mutiny. They say, like, this is crazy. What are we doing here? We're thousands of miles from home. We are never going to see our families again. He burns the boats. Meaning, you are now here. And Alama Iqbal, who's a poet, has a famous poem about this in Farsi, where he says, he describes Tariq in Farsi, he says, He smiles, he puts his hand on his weapon, 
And he says, Har mulk mulk e most, ke mulk e khudai e most. Every land is our land that is God's land. How can you say, in other words, that you are far from home, the whole world is your home? You're not, you're not lost. You're exactly where you're meant to be. And in a kind of crazy twist of history, one battle in the south of Spain, they meet King Roderick, the king of Spain, and he dies in the battle, and basically all of Spain is opened up. And the next 10 years are them moving as fast as they can to conquer Spain. And meanwhile, and this is the part that will surprise people and maybe confuse people because we like to think of our history as a very simple, easy story. Who was the second Khalifa, righteous Khalifa? I mean, his name is there, so yes. Omar, yes, Omar ibn al-Khattab. His great-grandson on his mother's side is Omar who? Ibn Abd al-Aziz, right? He's often called the sixth righteous Khalifa because he is... Well, not just grandson, but he's like Omar. He's, he is an Umayyad prince, but he's descended from Umar ibn al-Khattab. This part is going to be crazy. This is the year 717 when he comes to power. In Umayyad, the Umayyad Caliphate, non-Arab Muslims are not equal to Arab Muslims. This is 100 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Arab and non-Arab Muslims who serve in the military get different salaries. Non-Arab Muslims have to pay jizya just like people who aren't Muslim. There is an ethnic hierarchy. And Umar ibn Abd al-Aziz says, that's messed up. That's not Islam. This is a kind of ethnic nationalism. It's not, or you can call it structural racism, right? It's not what Islam is meant to be. He's only Khalifa for three years, but he flips the whole thing over. And he says, no, all Muslims will be treated equally by the state. And he changes tax policy and all these things. And this is the thing that I want you to remember. The Umayyads, how do they make their money? They taxed people who weren't Muslim. So they had a financial interest in you not converting to Islam. They didn't want you to be Muslim. Why? Jizya, they make more money. Also, if the person is praying next to you, they kind of feel like they have a claim on you. This is the Mawali system. One of the books you can read is Khalid Blankenship. He's a professor at Temple University. He has a lot of books. Marshall Hodgson, Venture of Islam. This is Umayyad state policy. It's actually Umar ibn Abd al-Aziz who overturns this. And one of the reasons the Abbasids come to power Not, not people didn't want people to be Muslim. The elite of society. Exactly. No, no, they did not. No, conversion to Islam was very slow. It happened over hundreds of years. And many times it was people who embraced Islam and pushed back against people. I guess that's the end of my talk. No, no, no. I appreciate it. Yeah. Should we pause for the... Oh. Oh, okay. But I will. You can email me. I'll happily give you more sources. So, it's Omar ibn Abd al-Aziz who overturns the system and tries to make society more Islamically egalitarian. What this means, to the Sheikh's point, actually, is that in many cases, it was people who became Muslim who then fought for Islam to be implemented and realized in the way it was meant to be. Just because people in positions of power claim to be Muslim doesn't mean that they uphold Islamic values. But the beautiful thing about Islam as a tradition is that it embraces people from all backgrounds to come in and try to build a society that is truer to Muslim values. And that's something that younger Muslims should always remember is that just because something happens in the name of someone who is Muslim doesn't mean it is therefore Islamic. Right? And so you have not just the ability, but the responsibility to constantly push for a community that reflects our values. And actually, when we stop doing that, 
we have communities that stray from our values because they're not course corrected. And so that's Iberian Airlines, which by the way is not a great airline, but you know, just in case you're wondering. I'll move very quickly. Um, does anyone know what this picture might be of? Come on, people who studied American history. Black pilots, yes, which pilots? Tuskegee Airmen, World War II, yes. It's very interesting. Many of the people here whose families are from the Muslim majority world, if you're South Asian, North African, West African, um, very possibly some of your very recent ancestors fought in World War II for the French or the British. Uh, in the case of Muslims who lived under Russian rule, um, many Muslims fought in the Russian military uh, in World War II, not always willingly or enthusiastically. The Tuskegee Airmen are one example of huge numbers of black Americans who fought in World War II and then realized as they were fighting, wait a minute, we're good enough to fight and die for this country and then we come home and we're treated like second class citizens. And this happened with a lot of Indians and Pakistanis and Egyptians as well. That we're ruled by a foreign power, we have no say in how we're ruled, and now we're being told to pick up a gun and go fight for that power. And then when we come back, we're still colonial subjects. And it's not coincidental that World War II was such a massive conflict that these powers had to mobilize millions of people and then had to deal with the fact that after that, you had the civil rights movement, you had people like Gandhi, you had people like Jinnah, right? You had all these movements of people who realized the incredible hypocrisy at work. And what happens in Muslim Spain is that while Muslim Spain is gradually consolidating, the Umayyads themselves are challenged by Muslims from other parts of the Khilafah over who gets to rule in the name of Islam. And it's a long, confusing debate, but basically what happens is the Umayyad royal family, for lack of a better term, the Khalifas, are wiped out, except for one man, as far as we know, whose name is Abd al-Rahman. Abd al-Rahman, anyone here named Abd al-Rahman? Maybe? No? Sorry. Okay. Abd al-Rahman is a very interesting individual. On his father's side, he's Arab, he's Arab. On his mother's side, he's Amazigh, right? The people that we sometimes call Berbers, right? He's half and half. He can move in both spaces really easily. And so, he flees from Damascus, arrives in Spain, which is in turmoil because the Umayyads are collapsing, and immediately people realize he's got the lineage, the ability, the character, the charisma, to unify Muslim Spain. And he does. And it reestablishes the Umayyad dynasty in the year 756 in Spain at a bridge over the Wadi al Kabir River, the Wadi al Kabir River, the original Arabic, um, at basically the site where the great mosque of Cordoba is. And he has a, he actually, when he goes into battle to secure the throne, he has a green and white turban. Someone points out to him, you don't have a flag, which apparently you have to have if you're in battle. I've never been in a battle, so. I can't say, you know, accurately or not, but he takes his green and white turban and he ties it to a spear and he makes it his flag and that's important for later. And he has the ability to unite the different factions that rule Muslim Spain and inaugurates a period where Muslims in Spain create Muslim Spain. They develop a kind of stability and sophistication and culture that like many other places in the Muslim world draws huge numbers of people into Islam. And part of the reason for this, you have to remember, is linguistic. This is before you had any modern communications technology. Even if you wanted to teach people religion, you had to learn their language, you had to learn their culture, you had to move from town to town, village to village, city to city. It was a very slow process, but over about 300 years, Spain became majority Muslim. By the year 1000, the majority of people in Spain spoke Arabic, faced Mecca when they prayed, identified as Muslim, but their ancestors were Iberians. Does that make sense? They're not. Some of them, of course, yeah, obviously in, in royal families and so on and forth, they have, you know, significant lineage, but Abd al-Rahman III, who becomes Khalifa in the year 912, he's got blue eyes and red hair because he's mostly Basque, the same ethnic group, by the way, that Picasso belonged to, according to many. Right? He's ethnically Spanish, speaks Arabic, 
identifies as an Arab, is a Muslim, eventually his dynasty declares themselves Khalifas, but this is really important to understand. In our best moments in history, we did not connect religion to race or ethnicity. We did in some of the bad moments. I'm not denying that. There were ugly moments. And we have to face those. But in the best moments, we didn't sit there and say, oh, you know, you can't be Muslim if you look like this. Or you have to be Muslim and dress like this. Like in a specific... They became part of that place. You follow what I'm saying? In the same way that if you grow up here, right, you speak English. You're an American. It doesn't mean your ancestors were literally English, right? But it becomes your language. And you become part of this society. In the same way, Muslim societies created that kind of culture that pulled people in. If you look at the paintings of the first Mughal emperors, I'm not saying this out of self-interest, the first Mughal emperors in India, they have clearly Central Asian features because they are descended from the Mongols. We have a photograph, like a, like a black and white photograph of the last Mughal emperor. He looks like a daisy guy. Why? Because they married into local families. The difference between Muslim rule and colonialism, and I'm not saying it was perfect, right? Like we're not reinventing like that society doesn't make sense. The difference between the two is when the British came in, they took the money and sent it back to London. When the Umayyads went to Spain, yeah, I mean, they were a royal family, they were elite, it wasn't a democracy, like, let's not kid ourselves, right? Like, you were either a royal family or not, but they, they were in Spain. They did not ship the money elsewhere. They did not wall themselves off from society. And so they built this remarkable community that in the year 1000, the capital, Cordoba, had 400,000 people, which, by the way, is bigger than Cincinnati today. Sorry, Cincinnati, right? But that's amazing. Had hundreds of libraries, sewage systems, right? Street lighting. And it's estimated 20 to 30% of the population was literate, which is kind of crazy, before printing presses and things like that. The first flying machine, like the first airplane, was invented in Muslim Spain, right? Again, this stuff is really amazing. Not that amazing, but it's good, like a nap, you know? Okay, so much so, and this part always blows my mind. In the year 1000, Muslim Spain rules over Portugal, Spain, Morocco. They have naval bases in what's now Monaco, and their army is regularly sighted in Switzerland. Like, they are a, a world-straddling behemoth. They're wealthy, they're powerful, their culture is attractive, people want to be like them. They smell good, really, because they had deodorant, right? It was invented in Baghdad, apparently, but it made its way to Muslim Spain thanks to a man named Zaryab um, in the year, I think, 821 or something like that, which is kind of cool. Um, they have naval bases in Sicily and Sardinia. Fun fact, Sicily was majority Muslim for a few hundred years, um, and then it all goes... Like, it, it, it goes down. Reza, that one's for you. You know what I'm talking about. That is not Mugsy Bogues, Toba Sakhrullah. That's your Muslim brother. Hakim Olajuwon, thank you, thank you. Who said that? You said you got that, right? Hakim Olajuwon, that's right. Where was Hakim Olajuwon from? You tell me. Uh, we said it earlier. That's right. There we go. It's all connected. See? Yes. Probably. I don't even know. That's, you know more than I do. This is terrible. I don't even, like, don't. Toba Sakhrullah. We're going to stop this. Okay. Here's the problem. When you build a royal family and set yourselves off from the common people, right, you start to mistrust your troops. Why? For the same reason some of the Umayyads didn't want people to convert. Because they have a claim on you. If you have a religion that says you are all equal before Allah, it's very hard to say, okay, now give me all your money. Right? That doesn't work. Right? So they start importing slaves to be their soldiers. Mostly, there was slavery in the Muslim world, but it was not linked specifically to a specific ethnic group. Mostly they were Slavs, so their slaves were white. Um, they imported them as soldiers to be their army because they didn't trust their own people, which is when you know you have a problem. And... Abdurrahman III declares himself Khalifa in 929. He doesn't, he's not, he says, no, the Abbasids aren't the real Khalifa. My family, we were the Khalifas before the Abbasids knocked us over. Now that we've built our power back up and we have this, you know, big fancy empire, now we can be Khalifas again like we used to be, right? 
And in 961, he dies. In the year 1000, the whole thing implodes. The fact I shared with you guys last time is they built a capital city. Um, Mario will appreciate this. The city was called Medina the Zahra. The city of Zahra. Who is Zahra? Yes. Who is that? And wife of? Hazrat Ali. Yes. May Allah be pleased with them both. Medina the Zahra. The city of Zahra. It's a city that was said to have 7,000 gates. I don't know if that's true. That's like a lot of gates, right? But like it had a lot of walls and gates and defenses. It was supposed to be, it was the most formidable city, certainly in Europe and arguably in the world. It was said to be impenetrable. Today, if you go to the site of Medina Zahra, you'll see like a few pebbles on the ground. It's all gone. Where to go? What mighty army could have attacked it? Louder. Loud. Not um. The um part is fine. You just have to say the answer out loud. People. Yes! Started fighting. The city was burned down from the inside. You can build the biggest palace in the world, but guess what? If the people inside aren't happy, not going to go so well for you. The city was burned down from the inside, starting a civil war called the Fitna of Muslim Spain. This is Muslim Spain in the year 961. In the year 1031, 70 years later, everything under this purple line is a different Muslim kingdom. You like that, Mario? That's for you. Um, that's bad. Because if you got people up here who don't like you, probably you don't want to be in like 80 different countries. Right? I mean, it's not a very good strategy for success. So they fought amongst themselves. And here's the crazy part. This is the part that always blows my mind. Oh, no, I, I have to give it to you here. This area here in Spain. Spain is one of the emptiest countries. Who's, who here has been to Spain? Yes, yes. Spain is one of the emptiest countries in Europe. You, will, you can drive for hours through parts of Spain and not see anything. Like nothing. Because it's very, other than I think Austria, it's the most mountainous country in Europe. It is not particularly hospitable to large population centers, except for very specific areas. When the Amazigh and the Arab came, many of the Amazigh from North Africa were farmers who were used to farming in Morocco. They settled this area here. Had their families, had kids, got married, built towns and farms. It was very much like the Morocco they knew. And the early Umayyads were very smart. They would give them, basically, it's the equivalent of UBI, universal basic income, right? Like, they would give them money because the farms were not profitable. But they would give them money as a way of kind of thanking them for, you know, the service they'd done to the state, for serving the military, this and that. As the Umayyads got more powerful, they stopped paying them. They didn't care. Why should they care? They have huge cities, power, wealth, money. Who cares about poor people? Who needs poor people? We have libraries and mosques that fit thousands of people and guess what the the people the farmers did stop growing food i mean yeah they stopped growing they couldn't make any money what do they do just what paul george did to the pacers he left yes they left they went back to morocco they're like why are we going to stay here there's nothing for us here and nobody noticed because who cares they're just poor farmers right except guess what bruh when the state collapses suddenly all these catholic states realize that nobody on the border anymore you get what i'm saying there's nobody there because they all left and nobody noticed because you had a big powerful army and they're all these people right but once they're gone the catholics realize we can just walk right in there's no one on the line and so they march right in and they take over muslim spain over centuries like there are setbacks it's a back and forth kind of thing but kind of the writing is on the wall as the expression goes make sense 
And so, I will say, how much time do I have? 23 minutes? Two. That's someone who did not like my presentation. That's okay, I, I don't take it personally. Uh, 20, let's say 22 minutes. Um, before we do anything, I will ask if there's any questions. Everything makes sense, there's a quiz at the end. There's not. Someone say yay? That's, that was me when I was a child. Okay, so here is my favorite statistic of all time. If Tariq ibn Ziyad had come ashore, remember Tariq ibn Ziyad, 20 year old? If he had come ashore in the year 2023, the Umayyads would have collapsed in 2321, and the last prosecution for practicing Islam, which was a crime in Spain, right? We always talk about cancel culture, that's cancel culture, right? The last prosecution for practicing Islam, which is a crime under Catholic rule, it was illegal to be Muslim, would have been in the year 3040. Which means that without power, without empire, Spanish Muslims survived for centuries under very difficult circumstances. These were not like ideal circumstances by any means. Most of the time, the Catholic powers told them that you either convert to Christianity or you leave, but if you leave, if you have any children under the age of 12, they have to stay. Can't keep your kids. Now, we like to talk about history as a black and white story. But actually, a lot of history is people facing really terrible circumstances and having to make really hard choices. Most people back then had never left their village. They had no idea what was on the other side of the world, let alone 50 miles away. And I mentioned Spain is a very mountainous country. You probably didn't even know it was on the other side of the mountain. And someone says to you, convert to Christianity or leave. Where are you going to go? With what money? How do you know you're going to be safe? Would you put your family's life at risk? Or would you stay? And again, it's a, I mean, it's a hypothetical question. Thank God, none of that. I'm assuming none of us have ever faced that kind of circumstance. But it happened. And so despite hanging on for centuries, and this is, this is the proof to the point that if people had converted at the point of a sword, if they didn't force to become Muslim, they would not have hung around. Why would you suffer for centuries unless you really believed it? Right? You just, you're like, all right, this is now that it's done, let's just go back to what we were doing before. And they hung around for centuries and centuries and centuries. 1728, when Benjamin Franklin was alive, by the way, is the last case of the Inquisition in Spain bringing someone to court for practicing Islam, as far as we know. And yet, this is the flag of Andalusia, the south of Spain today. What colors is the flag? Green and white. What else was green and white? Pakistan flag. Pakistan's in the bad. I love how we make everything about Pakistan. Saudi Arabia, yeah, that's true, but like I mentioned green and white in this class. Yes, Abdurrahman I had a green and white turban and tied it to his spear. They said, you don't have a flag. Blas Infante, who died in 1936, who was a secret Muslim, started a movement to make an independent Andalusia. And of course, when you have to have a state, you have to have a flag. He designed the flag and he made it green and white. Because he said, our ancestors are Umayyads, We're not like the rest of Spain. So our flag should be the flag of Muslim Spain. And if you go to the Great Mosque of Cordoba, which now is officially a church, you're not allowed to pray there. I mean, I know you've been there. I mentioned that I, I know someone who looks like me who has prayed there, even though you're not supposed to pray there. Um, I won't tell you how. Um, the soldiers who tell you not to pray are wearing a green and white flag. It's very surreal. It's like, but you're wearing the, you know, like they don't even realize that the, the, the badge of the police force they serve in has the flag of the Umayyad Caliphate. And then they're telling you not to pray, right? This is the history is kind of weird. But here's the, the thing I want to take away. What do you have, like 2 to 15 minutes? Yeah, maybe, inshallah. Any questions here? I'm going to give you my final lessons. The first is, Muslim Spain, majority Muslim. Portugal, majority Muslim. Sicily, majority Muslim. Fun fact, Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, many parts of Hungary, also majority Muslim. But because they're on the frontiers, eventually their populations are pushed out. The expulsions happen at different times, but in different ways. And so someone might say, had they forcibly converted everyone, then they would have never been pushed out. Right? Because if everyone was on your side, 
then you'd never collapse. It's morally wrong. It's also politically interesting. In Spain today, a country that we associate with Catholicism, the vast majority of Spaniards don't even get married in churches anymore. And this is something that I think Muslims should reflect on. When religion is imposed, eventually there is a backlash. When it is adopted out of conviction and enthusiasm, people hold on to it for centuries. But when it's imposed, they will reject it. And actually, this is happening in many parts of the West, that in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, you had very strong religious institutions that pushed religion. I mean, African Americans, when they were brought to the Americas, right? Not African Americans at the time, but West Africans, when they were brought to the Americas as slaves, 10 to 30% were Muslim. They were forcibly Christianized, right? This was a trend in many societies that you force people to adopt your religion. And eventually, inevitably, people push back because nobody holds on to something that they're forced to hold on to. The second thing I'm going to say, and then I told you this is going to be dinosaurs. Okay. Um, the, the, whatever that is on the left. Who's that? Jack Sparrow. Yes, Jack Sparrow is based on... Nope, but close. The Rock? That was, that was not what I expected. That was, that's, the, that's a new one. Guitarist, that's probably accurate. Jack Sparrow's character is based on a Muslim pirate known as Yusuf Rais. Barbosa is named after Barbarossa, who is an Ottoman admiral, Khairuddin Barbosa. Um, that happens in the 1500s, 1600s. Before that, you have Vikings. Like way before that. I told you I'd talk about Vikings. Hundreds of years before, Vikings, who were people from Scandinavia, seafaring people, right? They didn't actually have helmets with horns, but, you know, hey, don't tell the Minnesota Vikings. Um, they sailed around much of the world. They came to North America, obviously Greenland. Um, they actually arrived in Muslim Spain. In the year 844, the Vikings attacked Lisbon, which at the time was a Muslim city, and then made their way into Muslim Spain, up the, the Guadalquivir River. Um, the Umayyads retreated, thought about it for a few days, waited for the Vikings to loot, let them leave, letting them think that this place was defenseless, right? And then um, basically prepared for the Vikings to come with a bigger force. What they did is they poured oil in the water and they laid down chains. You can still see the chain if you go to Seville today. Ishbilia is the name of the city in Arabic. As soon as the Vikings fleet had entered the main part of the river, they lit the river on fire. This did not end well for the Vikings. Vikings never came back, right? Because that was not a good experience. Um, it, was, it left a bad taste in their mouth. Another group of Vikings settled in what's now Russia. They were called, unsurprisingly, the Rus, which is the origin of the name Russia and Belarus, and they founded the country that became Ukraine. And they traded with people there, including Bulgarians. Who's heard of Bulgarians? A Bulgaria country, right? Eastern Europe? Here's a weird fact. I'm going to tell you this is very strange. Bulgarians come from somewhere around here, near the Caspian Black Sea. They settle Central Russia, and they settle Eastern Europe. They form the country called Bulgaria. The ones who settle over here become Christian. The ones who settled up here became Muslim. They also call themselves Bulgarians. In the year 921, they send a letter to the Khalifa in Baghdad. They say, we've heard about Islam. We like it. Can you send someone to teach us the religion? And so they send a man named Ahmed ibn Fadlan, who's probably like, wait, where am I going? Right? Like kind of a weird assignment, like you're going like 2,000 miles to the north. There's a bunch of people, nobody's ever met them before, but apparently they want to be Muslim, so good luck. And Ahmed ibn Fadlan, being a good 10th century Muslim, writes a book about it. He goes up to the capital of the, they're called the Volga Bulgarians because they're on the Volga River. He teaches them about Islam. He's a faqih, right? He knows Islamic law. He teaches them Islam, helps them build masjids, teaches them how to pray, so on and so forth. They send a da'i to ask the prince of Ukraine who becomes the ruler of Russia, Vladimir, right, the founder of the, the Russian Empire, to also convert. He refuses. They have some bad blood between them. And then poor Ahmed ibn Fadlan gets kidnapped by Vikings. And apparently gets taken all the way to Scandinavia and keeps writing about it and makes his way back. And it becomes a book written by Michael Crichton, Eaters of the Dead. Based on the actual book, what else did Michael Crichton write? 
Jurassic Park, yes. So, actually, this is how it's connected to dinosaurs. Kind of cool. Here's the really weird thing. The Volga Bulgars, I promise this is all connected, in 1236 are conquered by the Mongols. Right? Not nice people. Genghis Khan wipes out Baghdad and Kazan, which is the capital of Volga, Bulgaria. Wipes it out. His grandson, Hulagu, is the one who conquers Baghdad. But here's where it gets really interesting. Hulagu's cousin, Berke Khan, is given rule of Ukraine. Berke Khan meets some Volga Bulgars, likes their religion, and converts to Islam. And then gets extremely upset when his cousin attacks the capital, Baghdad, and sends Ukrainian Muslim troops to Palestine to fight alongside Egyptian Muslim troops to stop the Mongols. Had they not stopped them there, the Mongols would have probably wiped out the rest of the Muslim world. As a result, oh, I already did that one. The Muslim population of Ukraine is so big that the Ottomans actually declared the Khans of Crimea, the Crimean Peninsula in the south of Ukraine, that they say, the Ottoman Khalifas, if our family ever dies, that family takes over the throne in Istanbul. That's how close the two families are. The first time Ukraine declares independence against the Russians, who comes to their aid? Ottomans. There would be no Ukraine if it was not for the Ottoman Empire. In fact, when the Ottoman territory in Crimea is attacked in 1853 by the Russians, the British and the French come to the aid of the Ottoman Empire because they don't want the Russians to have Crimea. And the defeat is so severe that the Russians are bankrupted and are looking for ways to make money. And guess what they do? Yes, they sell Alaska. They just need money. They're like, look, this place has got nothing in it. Like, we just lost to the Ottomans, the British, and the French. We can't defend this much territory. They sold Alaska to the Americans. William Seward, Lincoln's Secretary of State, buys it. And people call it Seward's Folly because they're like, why did you buy a massive chunk of like empty, frozen real estate? Then later, oil was found, so I guess it's a little bit different. This is the reason why. And nobody, it's fascinating. Nobody notices this. What's a Maidan? In Urdu, Arabic... Playground, a square, a field, yes. The Ukrainian uprising that triggered the current war was called Euro Maidan. Why do they use the word Maidan? Because of a Muslim influence. Right? This building here is part of the Kremlin. There's also a Kremlin in Kazan. This is a like a picture from right now, which has a masjid in it. It's the capital of what is now called Tataristan, which is a Muslim majority region of Russia. It's Volga, Bulgaria. The reason I'm telling you all this, and then actually the population was ethnically cleansed by Stalin, they slowly came back. Um, and this is a picture of the current Ukrainian military at an official iftar dinner. These are Muslim Ukrainian soldiers. Because many Ukrainians, especially in the South, are Muslim and are enthusiastically fighting alongside Ukraine uh, because they identify as Ukrainians because Islam is a part of Ukrainian history. Now the reason I'm sharing all of this, and, and I'll stop here and, and if there's questions, is that actually history is really complex and confusing. It's not a simple story of black and white. There are moments in time when people make terrible decisions. There are moments in time where people make beautiful decisions. And the ways in which we as a community historically have showed up in different places, different times, I think to me is a testimony of how incredibly global a religion Islam not only is now, but always has been. When Spanish Muslims were forced out of Spain, many of them made their way to Siberia because they found refuge with Muslims there. Their ethnic markers were not as significant as their religious framework. I'm not saying it was easy. It's never easy to go you know, thousands of miles away to a different culture, different place, but they were given refuge. And that to me, especially to, to, to young Muslims, but to all Muslims, should be a, a source of reflection that what actually makes life meaningful, the reason life is a test, and the reason it has beauty and value is because you have to make hard choices. Nobody knows in advance the test they are going to face. And nobody necessarily knows in advance what the right answer always is. Sometimes the answers are clear, sometimes they're not. And if you learn history, I was at an event yesterday um, 
with, with my wife and, and with Maria, um, where, where one of the speakers said, you know, when, when we feel really down about the way things are in the world, um, we should look at our ancestors and think, what if they had given up? And to me, that is the most beautiful lesson of history. I think it's such a profound statement that for whatever ups and downs Muslims community, Muslim communities go through, the fact is, as many of you mentioned, it was, a, and as actually as, as the Sheikh mentioned as well, it was a handful of people who brought this religion to so many places against incredible odds. Many of the Arabs who arrived in Spain were thousands of miles from home and probably never saw many of their families again, which is wild. And yet they did it and they kept going. And you see this happen again and again and again. And so religion should not be something that makes us fearful or timid or want to just kind of hide in a corner. It should be something that gives us confidence and courage and want to go out and build beautiful things in the world. So I will stop with that. If we have any questions, I believe we're very close to Salah time, but I think we have three, four minutes. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask away. Uh, if not, we can just wrap it up uh, in time for Aisha. What is the take home message? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Yes, that is a great question. Um, I will try to, did everyone hear the question? So the question is, what can we as American Muslims learn from history? So one is a general lesson I will say. Um, why does our religion forbid alcohol and other intoxicants? Yes, you sir. Yes, that is true. I will focus on the first part of your answer because you are correct. It makes you drunk. What does it mean to be drunk? No, no, keep... Come on, Bilal, say it. Did you say headache? It makes you do what you're not supposed to do. I love when everyone has an answer. It's awesome. Okay, I'm going to draw on a few of those because those are very important to understand. You don't... Exactly. In Islam. Okay, that's great. We got you. Yes, Egypt. Okay, we're going to end that there. Okay, here's the thing that's very important. In Islam, human beings, in the Arabic term, are aqil. It means we have reason. Anything that takes away our reason, any kind of intoxicant, is haram. Alcohol, marijuana, anything that causes you to lose your reason because the reason you are in the world is to always be mindful of Allah and to do the right thing even in difficult circumstances. So if it causes you to forget who you are, it means it takes you away from your fundamental purpose in the world. Even when it's hard, especially when it's hard, you have to be fully there. And what I would say as the general lesson is that what we learn from Muslim Spain is that you don't know what the circumstance will be. To assume that things will always be great for us is dangerous. But to then assume that we have no power is also dangerous. The final outcome is known only to Allah. But the thing I would note is that when Muslim communities were no longer politically engaged and socially engaged and part of society, it was only a matter of time before they disappeared. Because you have to have some kind of engagement with the world around you. The second thing is that when you forget about people who you think are unimportant, the consequences are severe. Right? It's very easy to live in a beautiful suburb. We do and think, oh, those problems don't matter to us. But if society has a deep fissure, eventually that fissure will consume everyone. 
right? Martin Luther King Jr. said injustice, I, I'm going to bungle it, but you know, in one place is, is injustice everywhere, right? So a truly welcoming society, a truly strong community is one that thinks of everyone, not just people who are comfortable. And eventually the consequence comes back to everyone. The circumstances are very different. We live in a, I mean, this didn't exist, for example, right? That didn't exist, right? The circumstances are different, but the deeper lesson, is the community one that thinks of everyone in the community or just a few people in the community? Is the community conscious that it needs to invest in itself or are we on autopilot? And finally, do we have a way where everyone feels like they're engaged or not? And this was, in Muslim Spain, this is what happened. So people did hang on and do amazing things. And I think that's, that's worth noting. But eventually, that, that's, that was not enough. You have to have institutions, you have to have communities, you have to have resources, and you have to have a plan. I hope that answers the question. Do we have time or are we done? One more? We're done? Okay, we're done? We're done. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.